The entire team at Emsolation want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We want to recognise that we are recording and telling our stories on the stolen land of our country's first storytellers. We wish to pay our respects to all Wurundjeri elders and ancestors and to extend that respect to any First Nations peoples who listen to Emsolation. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples' continued connection to the land and waters of this country and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Always was, always will be. Don't respect our privacy. Hound him. Leave awful comments on his social media. And Michael Lucas. I signed an NDA. This is Emsolation. We were so sort of watchful and panicked and excited. We were Jack Russell's on cocaine. You're in Emsolation. Well, hello there and welcome to M Salation. My name is M Rossiano. I'm a writer, a singer, a stand-up comedian, a maximalist power queen, a neurodivergent magic brain and a podcaster. And together with my best friend since I was 11, award-winning screenwriter, Mr Michael Lucas, I bring you this podcast every Thursday. Hello and welcome. I hope that I find you in a state of relaxation or perhaps you're out on your huffy puffy Maybe you're doing your chores and I'm helping distract you from that. Either way, just get ready because you have over an hour. (laughs) We thought about splitting today into two parts. Over an hour of Michael and I discussing everything from Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee Finesse to the awful allegations surrounding Russell Brand. We talk about the Newsreader season two and all episodes dropping Elio has become a goth and is exploring his witchy side. Odette, my middle child, Elio's my youngest if you're new here. My middle child, Odette, had a music concert that her school put on that will stay with me for all of time. And we also discuss, oh, there's so many things. I know I'm forgetting something. Anyway, it's a big, long old ep is what I'm trying to impart on you. So this intro needs to be short. Hey, there was supposed to be an announcement today of something, who knows what it is, but we're holding off on that for a couple of days. We've still got some things to iron off, but um, that will be coming all in due course, some kind of announcement around some kind of live show, perhaps. Who's to say? (laughs) And also I'm preparing, um, next Tuesday, I am presenting at the Senate Inquiry Committee hearing. It's a big deal. I need to sit down and try and write my lived experience in three minutes, imagine, and then answer questions from a panel. There will be ways to access that and watch it and Ben and I will look into it and make sure that we send it all out to you in an email. But it's an honour to be asked. I thought about not doing it but I'm so far down this journey and I've spoken so openly about everything. I feel like I need to put my money where my mouth is. But, you know, oftentimes when I do advocate or speak about it, I get my head chopped off. So I'm just bracing for another round of she's not disabled enough narrative, but that is happening. Um, There's just a lot going on at the moment. (laughs) There's a lot going on for both Michael and I in so many good ways. But that's it from me now. I'm going to say play the music because there's just so much for you to get through today. It's a big old main meal-sized emsolation. Okay, play the music. Luciano and Michael Lucas. This is Emsolation. Michael Lucas, we've just spent a good 10 minutes catching up on all the things that have gone on in the world of pop culture. It feels like six months of pop culture news has transpired in this, just seven short days. My goodness, what is going on? The first thing we will talk about, and it's genuinely, it's not often I'm surprised with news. Mm. And I do like that I was the one that broke it to you. 
You certainly did. In the announcement that after 27 years of mm-hmm. marriage, mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee Finesse are calling it quits, filing for divorce. It's over. O V A H, over. Our marriage is over. O V A H, over. That's right. That was not the phrasing that they used, but <laughs> that's a pretty good summation. Shall I get no, you the don't inane? Have to. No, I always enjoy these. Um, They've just, they're going to focus on their individual journeys. Oh, um, let's just. And you... they have gratitude for so many decades of, of great marriage. It's something like that. Of course, you've memorised it. No, I, that's just what they always say. Why isn't it on his Instagram? Isn't that where they put it? No. Hugh, six days ago, just put a picture of a sunset. Do you think he knew? Oh. Let's look at his Instagram from the last little while. She is absente. Okay. Okay, maybe I this maybe I dropped the ball on this one. They did go to the Met Ball the, earlier this the year. The last photo of him and Deb was May, and she was looking snatched. That is the Met Ball. That's yep. the last public. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's the thing, right? I mm. need to find the statement. I have to find the statement. Uh, 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 uh. Deborah, Deborah Lee Furtness statement. You don't even want to know. Well done. <laughs> I just typed Bebdebra Key Dinus Statamaka. And, <laughs> and my Google phone, was like, we know what you want. And my phone, yeah. can, you, can you see it? Yeah, Hugh Jackman breaks his silence. But can you see what I typed above it? Read it. <laughs> Debra Lee Dinus Statamenta. <laughs> my poor phone must just be like, Bitch, you should see my Google searches, but maybe it's a ploy. So if anyone ever finds my phone, they'll be like, she's a fucking serial killer. Yeah, what is happening here? <laughs> is she waking up in the dead of night just blindly smashing it? The answer is yes. <laughs> 100%. Where's the statement, bitches? <laughs> oh, my God. Let's see what this one says. Here we go. Hello, magazine. Okay. Oh, God. Why is it internet so... Here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go. Our journey. Oh, no, I want the whole thing, dickheads. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. Yes, I accept. Take all my information, steal my identity. Here we go. Oh, for fuck's sake, I've lost it. Oh, this is good. Our family has been and always will be our highest priority. We undertake the next chapter with gratitude, love and kindness. We greatly appreciate your understanding in respecting our privacy. Take a shot, ding, 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 as our family navigates this transition in all of our lives. Deb and Hugh Jackman. Just once. Mm. Michael, Mm -hmm. wouldn't it be refreshing if a celebrity couple released a statement that just said, I fucking hate them, I can't stand the way they chew, the way they smell makes me want to retch. (laughs) I'm over it, O-V-A-H. O-V-A-H. Like, wouldn't it be refreshing? I fucking hate that. (laughs) He spends 40% of his time in the family home on the toilet. That's the fact. He thinks about the Roman Empire four times a week. <laughs> you know, like, honestly, can we have, I want a realistic divorce statement just once. <laughs> just once. <laughs> God. My, hus- my ex-husband cannot be rich for comment because he's looking at cycling on YouTube. <laughs> Don't respect our privacy. Hound him. Yeah. Leave awful <laughs> comments on his social media. Opinions <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> Please tell us what you think. Mm. I love that. But I am genuine. Look, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. You were shocked. Can you talk about your time working with Hugh Jackman on Australia? (laughs) Because you are our insider. Like imagine we're Sunrise, except we're not getting Pauline Hanson to discuss Indigenous issues. We're actually getting somebody who was there on the ground. I'm glad that's the analogy that you've used. (laughs) You know, how, you know how those shows clutch at straws yeah. to get somebody that was kind of adjacent to the situation? Yeah. You were there. I, um, tell me. Look, I really did not spend much time. Don't because I there say was, that. Okay, all right, sure. I did visit set yes. around that time. And Adrian, uh, my husband, was, was around a fair bit. Can we side quest though? Yeah, okay. Wait. Can you tell my favourite story about <laughs> on Hugh Jackman's why are you looking at me like that? Can you please talk to me about it? I signed an NDA. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, so you visited set. 
I did visit set, yes. Yeah. Okay. I he love did. it that I'm, this is like my way to extrapolate the marriage. Tell you what, I visited a set on a good day because for anyone who remembers Australia, you probably remember one image, Hugh doing the outback washing <sighs> with the suds when he like Wait, tips the. I was thinking about it. <laughs> and I was there that day. They were pretty much just you filming were there. that day out of all the days so in the world. It was so exciting that you were there. I could have been there. Yeah. Of all the, it was Kismet, the universe wanted you there. But you know what? Like, I wish I could say, you know, uh, yeah, 20 years ago I saw the cracks. No, no. Ever, no, no, no he the was, opposite. Yeah. The, all we ever hear is yeah. the devotion. Absolutely. Talk about that. Absolutely. Well, even I know, I know people that sh- were working with her quite recently on The Dry 2 mm. and everyone to a person said it was this incredible marriage, the love and support. Um she was, she is a by all accounts not only incredibly intelligent, intelligent, but just funny. She's awesome. And, yeah. we, I've interviewed her. Yeah. They've got the adoption charity. Yeah, and we had her on the radio a few times, and she's like, she's so charismatic and hilarious, mm. and everything you want in a like in a human. That's she's right. Just like a juicy, great, amazing individual. I know, and in some ways, you know, inevitably her career has sort of been. <laughs> somewhat put in the shadows by his. But yeah. I mean, if you go back and look at Shame that she made in the 80s, plus Jindabyne, she's, she's she a cracker. She was cool. She was the... She was cool. He gained more from marrying her than opposite, by the way, at the point in, at oh, that point yes. in time. Oh, yes. She, well, when they first were together. Yes. Um, yes, it was, she was the star of the show. It was mm. my mum's favourite show, Corelli. Was that? Oh, yes. Now, how's your mum taking the separation? She... Well, I'm putting a pin in Australia, but yeah. She... Um, is, has always felt very connected to Hugh Jackman ever since Corelli. So she was a very early adopter, very early. Extremely. What St- year was that? Oh, like 93 or something like wow. that. She was right on there really early. She, um, her theory. Why do I feel like you are measuring on the fly editing? No, 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 no. <laughs> I just. I feel like Joe Lucas needs her own. I am not. I won't edit. I'll say exactly what she said. Oh God! Okay. She noted that there was a thirteen-year age gap, and she has noted that she herself is thirteen years older than Deborah Lee. So she feels like he maybe needs to double the age gap <laughs> and head straight for a pushing eighty-year-old, and that may be what he needs. Your mum. Yeah, it's possible. She's there. What? She's offering her. Her door is open. <laughs> it is absolutely. She doesn't lock her door. <laughs> he just has to get past the dogs. <laughs> They're cavoodles. He can get past the dogs. He'll, he can get. He's Wolverine for Christ's sake. <laughs> he is. He's looking ripped. He is looking ripped. There is not a shred of fat on that body. And let me tell you how I know. And let me tell you. I wish I had a conspiracy theory button, but I don't. Right. Mm. So here's my theory. I, there's something. And I sat on my family down and I looked them all in the eye and I said, I want you to mark this point down right now. I want you to know that I'm saying this right now. I want you to remember. <laughs> Something is off about this announcement. Mm-hmm. Something stinks because <laughs> here, are my, here are my reasons. First of all, they have lived in New York for quite some time. They're extremely private. No one has seen those children since they were 10 years old. Mm. I couldn't tell you what their children look like. No idea because they've kept them under wraps. Mm-hmm. You don't ever see them out and about at Soho House or having dinners. You will barely know the Jackmans live mm. in New York. In the last four days, both parties individually of each other have been spotted sans wedding rings strolling New York City just out for a fucking walkie walk. Like, what? No, but don't you think that could be to what? play the devil's advocate, as I always do? Well, obviously. To the, be the, fair. The, yeah, to be fair, the level of interest in them has escalated so sharply. Dude, it's Hugh Jackman. People will find, I feel like it was weird. So she's seen out, she's shopping, no yeah. wedding ring. The hand yeah. is very fully on display. He is holding a drink bottle, a, wa- a water bottle in his hand, in the wedding hand, and like, so, you can, so you can't help but notice it. And he's looking immaculate mm. and he's just strolling by himself in the middle of the day in New York, mm. no security, nothing. And the paps are getting perfect, beautiful shots. Mm. And it feels a bit tit for tat. Mm. It feels a bit strange. Mm. And also, why bother announcing? Just separate. It's weird because they are so private. Just do what needs to be done with the marriage disillusion and go your own way. Mm. Someone has met someone else Mm -hmm. or they've been 
kind of blackmailed or threatened into making it known because someone's found out. Mm -hmm. But they're getting ahead of something. Right. Mark Mark my words. words. Oh, if only someone were recording this. Wait! (laughs) (laughs) If only it was down on tape in a way that could be easily grabbed and time-coded. And the other narrative I reject is the idea that this is some kind of failure in any way. No, what a triumph. How long have they been together? Kids are adults now. Last kids, and some would say, another thing in my brain, Mm -hmm. the youngest is ticked over 18, off to college. Mm. Perhaps they were waiting. And Deborah Lee's 67. You know, at that point, you're like, if things aren't exactly right, you're on you're on the tail end of life. Mm. Maybe oh. you just want to go fucking do whatever you want, you know? Mm. But I just think the narrative that this is some kind of failure or that it's sad or maybe it's not sad. No. Although sources close to Hugh are revealing he's devastated. Really? And alluding that it was Deborah that dropped the axe and not Hugh. Right. Well, look, it just seems like a whole lot of questions with very few answers at this point, but no doubt we'll continue to speculate on it. That won't stop me. They occupy such a unique place in our culture. He, I would say, he regularly tops the Q scores in Australia, which are, of course, the measure of popularity. Like, he's he's always up there. He's like a Hamish Blake, right? Yes, but he he's had more decades than Hamish True. Blake. He was around a lot longer. Hmm. Um, no scandals. Give me a Hugh Jackman well, until scandal. until now. Well. No, you wouldn't class this as a no, scandal. No, you would not. Not yet. But, <laughs> but yeah, he, they, they really have had a remarkable, remarkable run. Yeah. And did you go see him in concert, The Greatest Showman? No. I, no, I don't know what No, no, um, Peter Allen. No, he did his Oz. own concert. Well, yes, that. But you then he, took your I took mum to see yeah. him do his one man show. Were you at the show where he sconed himself, f- zip lining in? That was Oprah's show. No, I was oh, not okay, there. Okay. Do you know what this does make me think, though? Tell me. It's also times the like fact this. that you took your mum. Hi, gay. Oh, absolutely amazing. Also, it was a great show. We enjoyed it. You would have hated it because he is not a singer. Singers. He's not a singer. And not He's only, a Lin-Manuel Miranda. Not only is he not a singer, by this stage of the tour, he was really feeling the strain. But I was impressed because I always perceive him as not taking a political stand. He did this big First Nations segment in it and he did Aww. really an impassioned speech about how he thought the future of our country had to be an embrace of First Nations culture and heritage. And, and um, it was re- I, I was surprised and he yes. really won the audience over. Then he, like, thanked Lindsay Fox. So, I mean, I don't know. Oh, we swing some roundabouts. But overall it was a good show. But what I wanted to say yes. was it's times like this yes. that I am sad that Oprah Winfrey does not have a show anymore because in the past the, we just knew she loves you. She loves him. He smashed his face open for her show. Correct. She, were this, you silent? Were you silent? Or were you silenced? Exactly. The fact that we have not had a primetime Oprah special, first with Britney Spears and now with Hugh Jackman, is it just pains me. I just think Oprah and Britney would be an unhinged, chaotic hell that would we I just don't think we'd ever see. Can you imagine Oprah? She would just be spinning the whole time, first of all. <laughs> Britney would just be spinning the entire time. Uh, I just feel like that that is not a good mixture. That's not because Oprah doesn't have the patience. Britney is like you know, like you need a lion tamer mm. at the moment. You mm. need somebody who's in there who's used to working with like startled, frightened, like. But I just feel like yes, Hugh and Oprah are sit down. That would be in Australia. It would top it's true. Meghan and Harry. It's true. Absolutely, it's true. Oh, my God. Well, we wait to see. We wait to see. (laughs) Mark my words, though. Mark it down. Mark my words. Not since you predicted that Madonna's tour would not proceed as planned. Well, (laughs) we we, we still wait to see if that's going to happen. Although I do love Madonna did. Michael Lucas was absolutely, I mean, he, I've never seen him so excited via text. Explain what Madonna did. Go on. (laughs) <laughs> you love it. You like, like, have a little nerd out. I do. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my mic off and I'm gonna allow Michael to have a little Madonna nerd out. Just a little like hyperfixation dump. He's gonna like just hyperfixation okay. all over us. Okay. Go. For context. Okay. One thing that I just love about Madonna is the whole give no fucks attitude. And I do think there's something very funny and playful that you need to be on the right wavelength to get. And so many most people, especially straight people, just miss it. 
most people just miss it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so as any Madonna fan or even a member of the general public would know, in 1989, she filmed a big, expensive promo for Pepsi. And it was to the song Like a Prayer around the time that came out. But then at the exact same time they launched the ad, she released the video clip, which was very controversial because she danced in front of burning crosses and she kissed a black saint, black sort of Jesus, oh. raised him, turned, brought him to life. Anyway, And the song was about head jobs. That's right. Yeah. So that's my read on it. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was actually part of the controversy. But in any case, it just it just made the song too hot to touch and everyone was like boycotting Pepsi. And so Pepsi had to can the ad, even though they paid her $5 million for it. They just walked away from it. She took the money. She took the money. Now, all these years afterwards, 35 years, Pepsi have decided to release the ad again, saying that they've been like, I don't know, um, uh, uh, artists disturbing the peace for 40 years and all this sort of bullshit, which is ironic because they they can the ad back at the time. that Anyway, so presumably they had to pay Madonna a truckload of money to use that song and that image again. She accepted it. Good for her. Good for her. But then what I lo- firstly, that in itself would make me respect and sh- the, her and the fact that she's like, look, eventually, you know, history has proven me right. This was a brilliant ad. Pity people couldn't see it at the time. But then what I really, really, really love was the day it went out, she went on Insta stories and posted a picture of her drinking a Coke that just said, also good. <laughs> Good for her. I mean, come on. <laughs> so good. What other yeah. pop star? No, no I, I, I thoroughly... Yeah. I worship, you know, we love... Yeah. What an iconoclast. Exactly. And she there's has, always been this element of her, it's like there's like it's like she's a brat in the but in but totally. in a really appealing way. Oppositional defiance disorders, what yeah. she has. Yeah. You know, I've totally pathologized that she's ADHD. Oh yeah. As if she's not one of us. As mm. if mm. I loved it. And I was getting these like Michael was sending me because Ma- Michael normally just sends me one measured long I know, text, I know. right? And I but Michael from me gets like machine gunned twenty in a row. That's how. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the way we normally text. This but was my me like phone you. was just buzzing, but I'm like, oh, what's going on? No, but I felt like you need to absorb all the stages no, of I loved it. it. It can't be one you, clump. Yeah, yeah, no, you cinematically. Because the worst it. thing would be if I sent you the Coke picture first, and then you saw that the first thing that you saw that would ruin the whole story. Oh, you crescendoed it stunningly. You, it's almost you. like you work in television. It's almost like <laughs> it. Yes. <laughs> okay, I love that I, you got to do that. Now we must talk about something extremely unpleasant. I want to give a content warning. We will be talking about sexual assault, not in great detail, but it is a topic that is a part of this discussion and I'm speaking about Russell Brand. If you want to skip forward in the podcast, totally get it. If you're not in a place to hear this, absolutely understand and just skip forward. Ben will put a time code in for you. Skip forward to 3340 to avoid the Russell Brand chat. Obviously, over the weekend, we were learning of the awful accusations that have come uh, at comedian, presenter. I mean, I don't know what he... He calls himself a thought leader now, which is a big red flag, Mm. isn't it, if someone says I'm a thought leader? (laughs) Like, I feel like, is that something you should say about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Do cult leaders call themselves cult leaders? I don't think so. No. I don't think they refer to themselves as cults. No. It's normally like the family, isn't That's it? That's right. Yeah, Families. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And up until 2019, Russell Brand was this, like he was just this lovable kind of rogue, wasn't he? Everybody, he was so immensely popular. I read Bookie Wook. Me too. And I have really happy memories of him in that movie with Rose Byrne and she was hilarious. Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Yes. Yes, same. Mm. And I got to, he came into the studio and we interviewed him and at the time I guess we had our kind of pre-Me Too goggles on in that he's overtly, and he was overtly sexual when he was in the studio, but it was kind of like a character almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. He had the scarf and the kind mm. of undone pirate shirt mm. and the messy black hair and he smelt like kind of gin and he was had leather pants on and he was sauntering up to the desks of, you know, like accounts and mm. any anyone mm. with a pulse. Yeah. He was like going, oh, you're right, you know. Yeah. He was being very mm. – and you almost felt special because he was shining his light on yeah. you. Yeah. And regardless of the weird, inappropriate shit that he was saying, and he was, mm. all of us I remember were just like, 
<laughs> yeah. So it was a special time in the 2000s. Was it the 2000s? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I guess when you I've really been struggling with this when you hear about the fact that it was an open secret. You know, mm. like everybody knew and it was kind of almost and this is so gross to say, it's almost his brand to mm. be sexually yeah, inappropriate, totally. right? Yeah. And in a way we're all complicit in encouraging that and investing in that. Well, and even the fact that, I mean, as has been rediscovered now, Danny Minogue was so pointed in calling it out at the time and sort of saying, you know, he says he's got over the sex addiction, but all I can say is his behaviour was incredibly inappropriate and she was really not pulling any punches. It was amazing how much, yeah, there was this element of like, but that's Russell. It's Russell. And we do that. He's cheeky. Oh, right? so insidious. And all of that, and especially when as a woman, I know I was certainly guilty of that and that's me dealing with internalised misogyny and, you know, just wanting to be, you don't want to be the person going, oh, but, you know, that's not okay. And everyone looking at you going, oh, you're such a party pooper. It's Russell Brand. Mm. And so often in radio I was the party pooper. So often I was saying, no, I'm not doing that. No, that's not right. Mm. And so I remember feeling like I just wanted to be one of the guys when Russell Brand came in. I do remember feeling that. Mm. So these allegations, this this investigation started in 2019. Mm. So this is a long process mm. that a group of very dedicated journalists and it was a three-pronged approach. Mm. It was Channel 4's dispatches, the Sunday Times and the Times and they all worked together and mm. it was thorough. Mm. There are medical records, there are, you know, women on record, there are eyewitnesses. Like they haven't done this lightly. Mm-hmm. And Russell Brand was kind of given right of reply before this became public a few weeks ago Mm. and he decided to get out in front of it and make this video. Mm. Now around end of 2019, 2020 COVID lockdowns, Russell really pivoted from being this mainstream actor, comedian Mm. into YouTube conspiracy theory territory. Yeah. Right? And now looking back with the the uh, the value of hindsight, one must question if this was a very deliberate pivot. Yes. I remember at the time he also, for me, was on the same trajectory as Naomi Wolf, the yes. um, feminist beauty myth author who also in COVID suddenly took a turn. Mm. And, yeah, at the time I was reading it as that. There was a conspiracy-minded part of them that were, but now, knowing what we know now, mm. his whole do not trust the mainstream media thing suddenly seems... Like a big, giant, premeditated gaslight. Mm. Don't you think? Yeah. Because now he spent all this time and he really picked... People were angry about losing autonomy and he was somebody that up until that point was quite left-wing... And then to have somebody then kind of cross over and say, you know, the vaccines are bad and we're having our freedoms taken away and this is, there's there's deeper mysterious forces at play and the mainstream media are tricking you and he started sowing those seeds of distrust with the media that were investigating him at the Mm, time. mm. And he very successfully did it. He draws all of his income now from touring and Mm -hmm. his audiences are the YouTube fans and from sponsorship and subscriptions on mm. his YouTube channel. He no longer requires... What's Lu- Louis C.K.? Correct. Mm. This man cannot be cancelled and he made himself uncancellable and it, this was a premeditated, I believe, six-year project for him. Yeah. And he has succeeded because mm. you go and read the comments under his video where he's categorically denying everything and his audience are almost pleased he's been accused by mainstream media of these things because he's been proven right. Mm. Therefore, they have been proven right in following him. Yeah. Well, it's like he can cast himself as some sort of messiah to the... He has. He does. He's the truth teller, the thought leader. He's the one that's going to protect them from the lies. Like you should... Some of the videos I had to... I just couldn't... I had to turn off and there's a part of my brain that was like almost going, oh, yeah, this is plausible. Mm. And I went in as a cynic but he's 
so charismatic. He's Russell Brand. Yeah. He was always super engaging, super watchable it's like a and funny. Funny. And it's a weird power that he possesses and it's absolutely terrifying. Yeah. So I think this idea, and that really stuck with me and, and I felt <sighs> the idea of the open secret, of the men that are open secret in all industries, because I kind of spoke about it on my Instagram, how there are quite a few men in the Australian entertainment industry that are, have the same thing, open secrets, that you just stay away from them. Mm. You, don't, you don't get in a room with them. You try not to be on lineups with them, whatever. Mm. And it's just something everyone just accepts, mm. you know? And, and it, I, I, amazing that it felt like we went... And through this big historical change in 2017 around Me Too movement. But still, but still there are all of these figures out there and just in day-to-day life. And today has been me. I've been going through my DMs and it is, we're hitting, it's only been a couple hours. I'd be over 500 and mm. it's just various stories and I'm not going to be able to do any more because at some point I have to protect my heart. Mm of women who work, you know, cleaners, accountants, nurses in surgeries, people who work in hospitality. Hospitality apparently is the worst. Um, Just every every single industry known to man are these men who are open secrets. Mm. And so the question inevitably is asked, Michael, why? Mm. Why do we protect the poorly behaved men, why do we allow them to keep behaving like this? Because if somebody just spoke out, maybe we save another woman from being a victim. More when we do make speaking out incredibly difficult. Exactly. It's Emsolation Extra. Haven't subscribed to Emsolation Extra yet? Here's what you've missed out on this week. Hello, Emsolation Extra pals. Well, we're back, 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 back again with part two of my chat with Kaz Cook. But a lot of people have menopause uh, suddenly mm. in in their 30s because of a surgical mm. or medical mm-hmm. or unexplained reason that's often a genetic. Mm. Uh, it's often very common that it runs through it does run in my family, a female yeah. line. Now found out. And I don't think anyone should be told, yeah, especially right. in their 40s, that it's too, too early. early. And that's what, I, that's what I always said in Girl Stuff, my books, mm. It's not too early to go into to get your first period because you just have. Yeah. And it doesn't make you a freak. Yeah. It just makes you. Compared to everyone else, in a I guess, normal of what they're doing. range. Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, and it's like the first girl to get a period in grade four or five feels weird. Yeah. And it's, so we don't know when it's going to hit us. And also even if your mother had this experience and your aunt, it, that might have nothing to do with, mm. you know, what what is going to happen to you. But, yeah, I guess don't ignore it. And so many – I've had a few women write to me quite angrily saying, you're behaving like you're the only one to ever go through this. And and I feel how, that – How, how – I, I feel like they're saying to me, I've survived this, I've done this quietly, and I feel like that's that internalised oh, misogyny. See. You know, it's them – Well, I think what that's about is that people have such disparate, uh, disparate different experiences – that a woman who has a very easy menopause is going to say, and I've heard lots of women say, what's the big deal? And a lot of the women in the survey said, stop carrying on about it. Exactly that same attitude. Mm. But you're not having the same menopause no. as someone else. For all of that and so much more, subscribe now at emsolation.supercast.com. It's Emsolation Extra. M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is, 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 is M. Salation. Okay, well, I now have a goth for a child. It is time we talk about. Yeah, I mean, your, your mind might go Odie, <laughs> but no. <laughs> no, Odie's like manic pixie dream girl. Odie's almost for me giving me sort of 70s California vibes now. How have I birthed such a cool? Because I am not cool. I'm not cool. She's got a really cool energy as well. I feel like that's, I feel like our energy, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, but there was a, there's a certain desperation in our energy <laughs> and there always has been, but wildly so in teenage years. Yes. We were so sort of watchful and panicked and excited and, 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 but Odie's just sort of. We were Jack Russell's on cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> What's that guy? How can I just, Odie just lets, you know what? We went out to find the world. 
Odie lets the world come to her. Seep into her. Yeah. She just and she's like she receives the world. Yeah, standing there on stage with her guitar. The bass that she taught herself to play. Oh my god. <laughs> I went to her high school music night last yeah. week. <laughs> For those who need reminding, Odie's high school is not like a normal high school. It's Euphoria. It's Euphoria. It's the Australian version of Euphoria. I can't even begin to tell you. So her school only takes in year 11 and 12s. That's it. And basically it's every kid, if they've been expelled from their school Mm. and they're a creative, Mm. that's where they go. She loves it. Mm. She came from a very traditional private school, which Mm. she always hated, and I regret not listening to her sooner Mm. because while she has gone to a school of total misfits, she has never been happier. Yeah. She loves it. And and when you go there, the fashion, it's insane. It's euphoria. It's yeah, insane. Yeah. The amount, it's just like I sit around going, oh, my God, look at that girl's hair. Look at those platforms. And so they had their music night. And so all the parents gathered in the auditorium mm. and – with our school, and my girls went to our school, our music nights were like, you know, chamber and, mm-hmm. you know, classical and, you know, yeah. it's, it's very... Oh, you might get a, a, a choral of, <laughs> of something from Miss Saigon. <laughs> totally. Or Les Miserables, your of course. torture. I hate Les Miserables. I love it. Uh, but no. So the night opened, the MC they had, she was the most unbothered human on the face of the planet. She was dressed like an urban pirate. This is a student. Yeah, she's a student. Oh, okay. Like an urban pirate. No sort of uptight music teacher that's no, doing no, the no. MC. There no, no, no. There were no teachers anywhere. Oh, of course not. I don't even know if the school has teachers, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... I think the kids just go there. I've gone from being hyper involved to I send Odie off into the day. I have no idea. I bail, I don't know any of her teachers' names. I've really gone hands off and she's right. never been happier. Right. Her grades are fine, which I don't even care about anyway. Yeah. And so I sat down once with one of her teachers and I literally said, I don't care what she gets on her tests. I just want her to love learning. Yeah. And I've never seen a more relieved human in my life. <laughs> and so and so we get there and, and we sit down and uh, no teachers and the opening, the MC comes out and she's like, yeah, so tonight you're going to see you know, a bunch of music and some of these kids are going to study music at uni and some are not. Like, and I don't even know what they're going to do in life. Who knows? And that was wow. it. She walks off. Wow. And I was sitting there going, are you joking? I'm hooked. <laughs> the first guy that walks out, his name's Keith. And Keith looks like Scotty Cam. Hmm. Keith then proceeded to go, g'day, I'm Keith. I'm playing Seven Spirals of Hell Death by, by Mega Death. <laughs> then he did a 13-minute... Death metal guitar solo, no other band members, just the guitar. Just. <laughs> Did you stay engaged the whole way? Yes. Riveted. He was very good. Yeah. And then it was just, and then they'd have the next band come out. And then the next band, like, someone was on the piano accordion. Someone was playing the bongo drums. Like, and then there was, and then their name's like, okay, please welcome to the stage, Mint, Zippy, Cloud. Um, and then there was like, oh, what were their names? It was like Zephyr X and Zephyr B. Like, there were two mm, Zephyrs. Mm. It was just all these names. It was just amazing. And then they played, well, they'd be Zombie. They played Zombie oh, by the Cranberries. That makes my heart oh. sing. <laughs> zombie, because that landed when we were about oh. her age. In fact, exactly her age, Every right? Every song was from the 90s that night. There was the, nothing. I, certainly the fashion was. You showed me what Odie was oh, wearing yeah. and I was like, she would have fit in uh-huh. to 1995 uh-huh. so well. Then the all-girl ACDC band came out oh, and they did this incredible kind of spoken word, Thunder. Ah, 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 ah Thunder. And then they'd be like, Thunder. I was like, it was so, and then the next girl that gets up, she sang a song called Pig's Blood on the Canvas. Oh. And it was this riveting tale of a She a composed farm. it, an original? No, I think oh. it was some kind of cool song. Okay. I think I'm getting the name of the song okay. wrong. Okay, okay. But it was like this story of a woman who lived on the farm and they had piglets, but she was pregnant and it was like this, all this weird thing. And there was this girl there with angelic long blonde hair, a crop top, low cut jeans, writhing around the stage, touching her microphone like a lover. And like all of 16, mm. every dad in the room was super uncomfortable. They were looking away from the stage and I was transfixed. <laughs> one girl sung Adele. One girl. Oh, which one? Which Adele? Total nerd. Oh, she Set sang. Fire to the Rain? No. No, no. Rolling in the Deep. Oh, okay. And she was a total nerd. That's what, she was us. That's what our high school would have been presenting at the she time. She was us. 
Everyone else was cool. To be fair to our high school, what it lacked in coolness, it did offer in sexual inappropriateness. Because remember Hanky Panky? I performed in it. Oh. It was it was Bell House's Year performance. Seven. I did that. Nothing like... I remember... I could do the dance. pre-adolescent... Yeah. <sighs> tie my hands behind my back and ooh, I'm in ecstasy. There was no editing of the lyrics. No. I remember performing to Janet Jackson's Velvet Rope. Mm. Do, you, do you know the words in... Do you know the words in that song in, in Velvet Rope? Can you recall the lyrics? I can... I... Yes, I had that album. I can't recall the lyrics. I do remember once at the end of a school camp, um, Kylie... Uh, um, Carly Jones and Megan Marshall performing Throb by Janet Jackson. <laughs> and basically that has, there's, it's like there's not even like much music in that. It's just like Throb. Wait, throb. is it? Here we go. Okay, here are the lyrics. I can feel your body pressed against my body. Wrap yourself around me. Love to feel you throbbing. Throb, yeah. throb, 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 throb. DJ make me wet. DJ make me wet. DJ make me wet. DJ make me wet. Throb, 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 throb. Boom, 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 boom. Until noon, noon. Throb. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. It was so good. I, I, said, saying... I still remember there was a was, there was an older teacher. Was her name Mrs. Canty or something like that? I still remember her just watching the whole thing going, thanks, girls. <laughs> Wait, I'm not saying it wasn't Velvet Rope. What was the song I'm thinking of? What was the song? She opened with it on the tour. Rope Burn. Uh, That's the song. Let me read you some of Rope Burn because I was singing it on the weekend while I was cleaning and then I was thinking, I oh, you sang this as a kid. Mm. And I just think, here we go, Rope Burn lyrics. I think I've got memories of you singing Black Velvet. Absolutely. <laughs> Mississippi in the middle. <laughs> the Where most I'd virginal land. girl. <laughs> like... <laughs> I never understood what that song means. Why is Rope Burn lyrics not coming up? Oh, Robert. Why? Robert Burns lyrics. Wait a minute. Oh, this is he's got so much editing to do. Rope Burn. It'll be worth it. Lyrics. Here we go. Okay. Tie me up, tie me down, make me moan real loud. Take off my clothes, no one has to know. Whisper and I wanna feel a soft rope burn. Wanna feel a rope burn. Come into my velvet rope and tell me your business. <laughs> While you're at it, take the blindfold, tie it gently on me. Don't want to see, but feel the things. Tie me up, tie me down, make me moan real loud. Wow. Wow. I'm just okay. 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 <laughs> anyway, the music night was amazing. I have to say it's one of the greatest things. I've, and the MC just gave... The last thing she said was, thanks for coming. I mean, maybe you enjoyed it, maybe you didn't, but, I mean, I'm so tired. She just lit. She was the lead singer in the ACDC band. <laughs> Can I just, you haven't yet described what was going on with Odie. Oh. I just recap for everyone. Odie was too... Let me just lead through the inception light things. We are actually talking about Elio being a goth, but that got onto the concert, which then got onto Janet Jackson in the 90s, and now we're back. And let's just recap what were you going to say about Odie. She was amazing. She was so yeah. cool. Like okay. like, I, I, there's nothing I can say. Like her group, did, I've seen the footage. It was they did very a Deftones cool. song. Like it was really cool. It was good. She was cool. Let's just say at the time I was in the dance number to One Night in Bangkok, and I was not. My energy was very different. <laughs> I can see One Night in Bangkok. Oh yeah, totally. Do you remember the moves? No, I remember Jungle Boogie. We also did Jungle Boogie too from Pulp Fiction and I did Grease. Can I say that I walked past <laughs> I walked past <laughs> primary school the other day and they were in the middle of a Lion King performance. Really? <laughs> <laughs> As in like Circle of Life doing the opening or? No, they were all dressed up in tribal gear. Okay. Rob Mills and I looked in the window and saw it. Wow. Let's just say. Nice. <laughs> 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 Elio's a goth, okay? So, right, so she, he, he comes to me and he's just, he's just become obsessed with witches, warlocks and wizards, but he doesn't really understand why they're different. So he calls himself a wizard witch warlock. That's it. That's all he is. He That's loves good. it. And I'm trying not to gender it. I, I yelled at Scott this morning because he was like, witches are girls and oh, what? warlocks are boys. And I said, <gasps> no! 
No. All of the things. Yeah. So Elio, we, he said to me, can be a and he said, I want you to make my room into a witch's lair. Mm. And I said, okay. I'm going to love a theme. Mm. I've, I've been so sick, but I didn't care. Mm. I sprung to action. Mm. Him and I went to the shops and we walked around and he was just pointing at things and I was just putting them in my trolley. <laughs> he was so happy. I'll take that. I'll take that. And it was gruesome. It was bad. I had to say no to a few things. We are in the lead up to Halloween now, so there would have been some good stock for Halloween's you. Halloween's his Christmas. And quite frankly, I would rather him be excited about Halloween than Christmas. It's just less commercialism. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever. So we, we got all the stuff. We went to his, we went home. We got a life-size skeleton that's lights, the eyes light up red. Oh, yeah, yeah. Bats, spiders, everything. And um, he helped me clean his room. He put it all together. And then this morning he said to me, I want to see a wizard witch warlock. And I said, okay, well, I think it might be time. I think it might be time for Harry Potter. Oh, I've been training for this moment my whole life. <laughs> I am really happy for you about this because leading your other two children through the Harry Potter series was such a journey for you. And to think that you get the chance to do it again from the start. With a natural born nerd. With a natural born nerd. With a much more conflicted relationship with J.K. Rowling. But let's not think about that. Uh, yuck. I know. I thought about that. But I'm not going to punish the no, beautiful no. fandom and the yeah. actors and no. the messages. that Like, she's superfluous now. I don't care. It's bigger than her. So I'm like, okay, send the pressure. The pressure, Michael. Which, where do I, like, how do I, what do I do? How do I start? Where do I go? Yeah, do you go the book or do you go the movie? Well, we went to the movie. Yeah. And I skipped all of the first bit where he sleeps under the cupboard. You know, like, okay. Elio doesn't care for that. No, Elio. Leo wants he wants action. Yeah. So we started it where oh, Harry goes through the wall at not platform nine and three quarters. Ah, uh, good, good call. That's where we start. Mm. So he doesn't know all about the terrible childhood. He mm. doesn't need to be burdened with that. He's only four and a half. And I found Chella's old Hogwarts Gryffindor cape. So then we had to explain Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, and Slytherin. Of course, Elio's like, I want to be in Slytherin because they're evil. Okay, we have a real problem. Like this, this could, this could divide our family. Elio says he's not Gryffindor. Elio has decided his house. And who have you decided? Slytherin. 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 Slytherin? Yes. So you're green. Yeah. You're Slytherin, the snake house. Yes. But they're bad. Uh-huh. And we're like, no, you're Gryffindor. Shut up. All right? You don't get a choice. You're Gryffindor. Although Chella is Ravenclaw and she knows it. Odie's Hufflepuff. I'm Gryffindor. We all know that. Scott, <laughs> the whole sorting hat would not know what to do with Scott. I don't know. Hufflepuff. <laughs> so, so he's like, I'm not getting a reading. He'll be Hufflepuff. <laughs> so we, we convince him he's Gryffindor. So sitting there, he's mm. Gryffindor. I'm hey. a Hufflepuff. I would say Ravenclaw. Really? Yeah. I've done the test. Oh, the tests are bullshit. Okay. You need someone who's a proper Harry Potter fan. No, you're Ravenclaw. You're okay. not Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff don't, they don't really stand for much. Okay. You stand for things. Ravenclaw are traditional devil's advocates, always. Totally. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. So anyway, so he, he's sitting there in his Gryffindor coke. He's got a witch's hat on. He's mm. holding a Satan pitchfork. So he's got all the genres covered. <laughs> and then he said to me today when I left, can you get me a Harry Potter costume in my size? I said oh. to him, I take this honour. I will not let you down. Um, this has never been a great quest. This can is I like just Princess say, Bride. also, he, he could do a good Harry Potter. Totally. He um, um, physically. Yes. Mm. The round glasses. Also a good young Harry Styles. That's <laughs> the, He's just got Harry's covered Harry, all Harry, over. Harry. So he's totally into horror, which I hate. He loves all things gore. Remember, he was into Siren Head when he was two. So we're really progressing. But I just, now we're entering into fantasy I'm starting to make lists of movies we can watch. We can go out dressed up. Like we went yesterday to Westfield. He was in full skeleton costume, full face paint, witch's hat and a Satan's fork, walking mm. around casting spells on people. Mm. And everyone was delighted. Yeah, they were so delighted. Yeah, Creepy when I do it, delightful when I'm four and a half. <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing. I loved it. So, yeah, that's where we're at. Once we're done here, I'll be off to some kind of costume situation okay. and he'll be getting Are you already full... conceptualising? It's not long till his birthday. I mean, it's January. But, um... I know, we're going to have a full... It's, it's, his, it's the big five. We've got to have oh. a big party. Yeah. So we're going to make it full Hogwarts. Halloween themed. I think oh, just Halloween, Halloween. themed. Because okay, yeah, yeah, he yeah. likes all of the things. He yeah. loves skulls. He sleeps with a fucking life-size adult skull in the room with red eyes like Terminator. Wow. He wouldn't let me take it out. Wow. So I walk in there last night to check on him, give him his you know, midnight yeah. kiss. And the skeleton's just like beaming down on his face. Wow. Loves it. <laughs> oh my God. I just, 
I always get asked for parenting advice, right? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. But the one thing I will say that I've learned that I didn't so much achieve with Chella, I did to a point, but Elio is really getting you be whatever the fuck you want and I will financially yeah. support it. <laughs> whatever also, you show interest in. You what, do a good job of getting enthusiastic about what your kids get into. You've yes. always been really good at that. I love that. I know. And look, financially, if if he had come out and said, Mum, I think I love sequence, you like you would there would be so many savings. You would have been so set. You would just have everything know, there on hand. I know. That would have been easier, but that's not what it's about. No, I don't it's care. It's about the effort. It's just about totally not worrying about what other people think of them. If they do want to go out in full costume, if they do want to in, you know, say incantations and spells out loud, <laughs> dooming people to all eternity, whatever. <laughs> you just go along with it. You let them lead you. That's my advice mm. because he is so happy. Mm. And uh, his carer, Steph, arrived today. Poor Steph. Mm. Holy shit. Because if you've got an autistic kid and they have a new hyperfocus and a new special interest topic, mm. and Elio has spent the weekend just, m- like, memorising everything. Mm. So she's now just in for, like, witchcraft 101 for the entire day. Mm. The poor bitch. <laughs> I don't pay her enough. No. <laughs> She left me and she was wearing a witch's hat and she had like a cat on her shoulder Aww. and the cat kept falling and he's like, the cat has to stay there. Because <laughs> like, oh, okay. McGonagall turns into a hat in Harry Potter. Anyway, oh, my God. We, we, we're like, what are we going to talk about today? I know. <laughs> well, all six episodes of the Newsreader are now available on mm. iView mm. like Beyonce. <laughs> That's how I framed it, yeah. A surprise drop. And it feels like a surprise even to you, maybe. <laughs> because well, there was a lot of actors suddenly posting yesterday. Yeah. It just felt like what I'm reading is that the ABC were like, wow, this is being super successful. Everybody's loving it. Let's just go balls to the wall. <laughs> and you, and it felt like all of you were even caught off guard. A little, well, uh, weirdly, there's always been this like quite a tense debate about whether it should be presented as a binge or as what a rollout. What do you prefer as a viewer? Do you prefer the weekly rollout or the binge? And this is, from what I can see, dividing. People. Yes. Um, what do you prefer? I prefer uh, the binge. No, I'm a rollout. I'm yeah. a rollout. But having said that, though, I mean, if it's available to binge, I will always binge it. But I respect the rollout. <laughs> But, you know, I do understand, I, I definitely understand. Apparently, it does seem to be an age-based yes, thing. Yes, for sure. Yes, because the data we had coming through this year was that, like, seriously 95% of audiences mm-hmm. under 40 were just watching it online, not watching it on air. And wow. so, and I don't know, they, they claimed their anecdotal evidence was that they wanted to binge. And there was this whole debate about whether it works better as a binge. Mm. What do you think? I was enjoying the rollout because simply I trained myself to it's something. And as you know, I consume your shows like the audience does because I mm. want to be able to give you that perspective. And so I was like, you know, I was every Sunday the family and I would get, mm. we've done the last year where we gather around. Mm. But because I got used to the rollout, then all of a sudden when I was presented with every episode, I felt overwhelmed and like mm. I was staring into the sun. Mm. And I was like, oh, there's all this content to take in. Mm. It's one of my schedule because at the moment I've got so many things on my TV watching schedule. But no. So I did feel a little bit like I was full and then offered another delicious meal that I had to try and eat. I see. But I did eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I've consumed the entire mm. season. Wow. And In a short amount of time. Very short. Good for her. <laughs> You fucking nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot because people will know M will just tell me if she like. I'm autistic. I, yeah. She'd be like, I was bored. I said, I can't lie. That's a, that's a line from a wheel yeah, of she's time. A, unfortunately, I've got that from M and my mother. True. You are surrounded by absolute truth tellers, which is why your work is exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> because you've never been allowed to be mediocre in your life. Yes, yeah, so I could pick up the phone the next day, go, hi, mum. She's like, well, I didn't like that episode. <laughs> Not in this case so far. No, I... I'm so proud of you and I'm hard on you. I am hard on you because we are both connoisseurs of television, especially of drama. We've read every script. We've grown up on Sorkin. Like it's just something that's – and so the pressure on you, I just want to tell you, the pressure on you from me, but, and I wasn't really letting you know the pressure. It was, I was nervous as I pressed – I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? How am I going to – I can't – what am I going to do? How am I going to tell him? I'm going to say things like the costuming was amazing. Those shoulder pads. Gee, the music – Great top-notch music. <laughs> I like that they played pressure down. <laughs> I love that they played pressure down. I love that whole thing. But no, nah, 
I'm sitting there and especially episode four. Your episode. We need to have a talk about episode four. Sure. Episode four, it's like the series takes the right-hand turn you've been waiting for. Everything happens. But what I didn't know was (laughs) I knew that I was the voice of white colonialism within the promo and I knew that the promo kind of played twice within the episode, but I, I just didn't really... You said to me, oh, the Indigenous, the um, activists, they see it. But I didn't know that they would be sitting all together. How would feel? Yeah, I know. Well, spoiler alert for everyone. But, the, the, yes, this was, the, was kind of the mission for the episode. Okay, wait. We haven't really given anything away yet, but no. spoiler alert for Ep 4. Go. Yeah, well, the like what we were hoping to achieve was that you, we open with this promo, this jingoistic promo being shot, but we want the audience to just enjoy it. It's fun, it's colourful, it's nostalgic even. Jingoistic means aggressively nationalistic. Yeah. Yeah, patriotic. But we were deliberately evoking celebration of a nation and we were hoping that, you know, even though obviously the audience would have that in mind, but still it's a fun sequence. Like it's a comedy sequence at the start. But then we were thinking we wanted to tell a story, take you on a journey and then play it again at the end through a different perspective and punch you in the gut really badly. Just make you want to vomit and cry. (laughs) Underscored with my fucking singing voice. That's right. That's right. I know. I didn't know how to feel. I was sitting there and all of a sudden, like, Helen's realised the interview's being bumped. Then the jingle starts playing and I'm like, no, no. Helen stands up. Then my voice just gets cranked to 10 because initially it was just in the background. Helen's walking out. I'm like, no. We flash to the lounge room. Oh, fuck. <laughs> then my voice is louder and louder. I'm like, oh, my. I felt goosebumps at the scene and the sentiment and the way that you flipped the perspective and part of me was like, yes, bitch. And then the other part was like, what a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no warning. No warning. <laughs> no, well, you know, it's a, it's a fictional character you're playing. <laughs> Her name's Rhonda. Rhonda. Yeah, I mean, and let's hope Rhonda gets another shot at it <laughs> in season three. Let's hope Rhonda gets to be even grosser. Don't worry, it's 88. She's not going to pay any price for her, <laughs> like, white supremacist ways. Scott saw it and he's like, yeah, but why are you there? Like, why are you there? Because I haven't, you haven't been in the show at all and all of a sudden you're just a character. Well, you're a, there's a singer. No one else can sing. I said... Um, excuse me, I am the Rhonda Birchmore yeah. of News at Six. <laughs> <laughs> I am Rhonda. My character was named in honour of Rhonda Birchmore. That's right. So I just, I said, so how dare you? And I'm sure she'll get a magnificent arc in season three if there is one. Magnificent. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the day was, it was such a fun day and we haven't really been able to talk about it. But no. I did do my own wardrobe. There's been a lot of commenting on that, which yeah, I love. I know. Tweets. And Ben Wasley was there he too, was. in the background, bow tied, yeah, well, and spectacular. I'm going to say suspenders, suspenders, but I mean braces. Braces, that's what I meant. Yep. Yeah. It was a great day. Yeah, and and Daniel Doody from Studio Ten, mm-hmm. he was there, mm-hmm. and Nate Byrne from ABC, mm-hmm. yeah, and our composer Cornell, oh. who who um, composed the the song that M sings from yes. my terrible lyrics. Terrible. So I had to go to Cornell's studio to record it on the day. And he said to me, now Michael's written some lyrics, but we may have to. And I said, oh, Michael always overwrites lyrics because he's a writer. But it was good. And then he said to me, just go in. Like, he yeah. said to me, power. And I said, are you, sir, asking me for a power 80s vocal? And he said, as powerful as you can go. So oh, I did. I was the funnest, most. And I sang it through once and Cornell turned to me and he said, wow. And I said, thank you. He goes, that's Really good. He was so excited. Mm-hmm. He's like, I didn't know you could sing like that. I knew you could sing, but I, he's like, no, I hope I hope we can find the male vocalist to match you. And I'm like, well, <laughs> good luck, sir. Good luck, sir. There was actually a male vocal, but it's not really in the episode that nah. much. There's a little bit of him. He there. was good. He was great. He was fine, mm. but not me. Not you. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you know when we were first talking about it, the first vocal reference that was brought up? Mm. Kate Sobrano. Really? Yeah. Because, like, Cornell was just talking and so as soon as that happened, I'm like, look, <laughs> if I know what you want, mm-hmm. I know what you want mm. and I know where to get it. For also, free. she'll do it for free. <laughs> that was a factor. Oh, thanks. Well, no. No, you probably should have. perfect. Got- it was perfect. No, no, we, there was no way we could get her because she really was a star in the 80s. It'd be weird. Yeah, that's true. Mm. And it wasn't her voice. But, no, it's... 
I'm, I'm grateful and, yes, I enjoyed it and I've got lots of messages about it. We are going to insert the full song. Mm, beautiful. It, at the end of the episode. Mm. Today you're going to get the entirety of it. Mm. Stunning <laughs> recording. But is it hitting? Because I know you and I, we were messaging last mm. night. You sat up obsessively looking at the newsreader hashtag on every social media platform. Yes. Well, I mean, unfortunately you've kind of got to go back to X because – that's Twitter. Just call it Twitter. Twitter. I refuse yeah. to call it X. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But it has been such a joy because like I, my career started at the peak of Twitter mm. and it used to be just part of it that I thought was so funny. But to be honest, it's kind of died off Twitter, but also now TV, it's very rare that everyone thinks everyone's watching as particularly a drama all at once. Mm. But something about this, mm-hmm. just there are all these people and they're not in Australia. I mean, some of them are in Australia, but a lot of them are just all over the place. A lot of Interview the Vampire, Last of Us fans and all yeah. that sort of stuff just poised and they binged and they basically just recorded their experiences watching it. And they, it's just so funny. They are the queerest, most hilarious, most they're passionate. Astute. They notice all the nuances. Oh, and emotional. Yes. They are, they are reacting so emotionally it's to like it. It's like us when we react to things. Know. You know, like when we, we always overreact to things. And when I say overreact, it's like, oh, it was visceral. It's changed my life. I've got a new sexuality because of it. Like that's how we are about mm-hmm. things. Behind. Overinvested people screaming things at the characters. Oh, just... You have, it's 10 out of 10. You could, like, you couldn't hope for more. Oh, fucking... That part about it was great. And I actually probably will be forever grateful that there was that surprise drop because it was truly. Because every, everything's hit everyone at once. Yeah. So it's not eked out. It's just this wave of incredible. And that Guardian review, I'm sorry, you did earn five stars. And I don't <laughs> say that lightly. <laughs> and I, up until this point, I was the only one of us who had received a five-star review in their career. <laughs> And I'm giving you an honorary five star. Oh, thank you. Thank because you. Because I honestly cannot think of a better Australian drama ever. No one has tackled the bicentennial like that with that lens and fucking brave and awesome. And the, the episode, the, the oh, it was written. Oh, yeah. Well, I actually, I do have to think, with that episode, obviously I was knew we had to tackle it. I was pretty nervous. Pretty oh, yes. Nervous. To put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. And so I've got to give massive credit. Please so Adrian do. Russell Wills. Um, he was the writer. He, I've worked with him before. We worked together on Wentworth and I went to him first. Mm. And uh, he has his own amazing history in terms of his relationship to the Bicentennial, mm. which that's a whole other story. But um, He's First Nations. He's First Nations, yes. yes. And I went in with all these bullshit ideas, of course. Like uh, my initial first idea was, oh, yeah, yeah, I was all like, I had an idea for like maybe we could start with like a reporter who doesn't realise that they have some sort of Indigenous heritage and we tracked that story kind of a bit like Ray Martin sort of had the sort of. Got it. Anyway, and he just sort of said, no, 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 if you're doing this, you should put the spotlight on one of the activists because they were amazing characters. And now it's played by Hunter Page Lashar. But even with even with that, I was like, oh, yes, oh, yes, right, right, right. And this is more bullshit whiteness coming out. I was like, mm, oh, so I'm imagining like a Martin Luther Kingy character. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's going to be a brat. He's going to be passionate. He's going to be smart. He's going to be annoying. He's going to be like and playful and flirtatious oh. and all of these things. And and so I just listened to him. Good. And let him. And, and then like Hunter gets the script and just he, he? knows it. Mate. He just knew intuitively. He didn't need to have a meeting with Adrian. Best newcomer, like... Logie, done in the back. <laughs> it's not a newcomer. Oh, best actor. <laughs> he's been on Play School. He has been on Play School. Yeah. No, no, he's, no, he's done heaps of stuff. Of course, he's he's mostly. He's. I still think of him as playing teenagers. Whereas in this, he's he's Centered, progressed beyond he's, that. Ooh, he's great, and the way he dances to oh, Queen Marsha oh, Hines. Oh. oh my God, that was so great. Well, that was his idea. It wasn't in the script. Oh. He said his one note. He read the whole script, and I was like, "Do you like? How do you feel? Do you?" Do you want to tell me anything? Do you want to tell Adrian anything? And then he was, he said, I remember him saying, no, I can tell a black Did your husband this. direct Ep4? No, 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 Adrian, oh. the writer. Oh, the Adrian. writer, okay. Sorry, two Adrians, Adrian Russell Wills. Yeah, and, he, and then he goes, I've got one, just one thing. I'm like, yeah, what? And he's like, when he's playing Marsha, I just, could I dance? And I'm like, sure. What a dancer. I know, so great. Woo! It was so good. And to your credit, unlike Christopher Nolan, you get out of your way. You got out of the way and you let someone else come in, you know. So many straight white dudes wouldn't do what you did. You literally handed it over in the best possible way Well, and allowed yourself to be guided. No, not many people do that. That's why everyone gets it so wrong. Yeah, but also, like, I could hear what he was saying 
were like really good ideas. It was better. And yeah, and because so he's I just, got the perspective. Totally. And also he he because he he was adopted and and he so he had this interesting perspective because he himself has gone into that world mm. as a kind of an outsider. Mm. And he would say things like they'll test you, they'll they'll make you wait. And all those things like in if you've seen the episode it's all like she's trying to get an interview locked in and he's like going oh, we've got to go to Yumcha. That's all stuff from his life that Love happened it. and obviously needless to say I would never think of anything like that. I no. would have no I would have no reference point for any of that, but he just pulled it all out and I could see but it's it the great. lesson, the classic lesson of have the people in the room that you're telling yeah, the story totally, of. Yeah, totally, totally, Which a lot of, I mean, we say it like it's an obvious thing. Yeah. But it's, it's not. Yeah. It's and not. then the other person in it who, fun fact, has a connection with you, there's an amazing actor, Tony Briggs, who wrote The Sapphires, the great, I mean, you know The Sapphires. Mm. He plays one of the uncles in there, but it's all of, he's also, you know, so well connected in community and in uh, Victoria that, that a lot of the um, the other activists are his family members. Mm. But also he was an athlete with you. He was. He's a good friend. Good friend. So handsome. So handsome. Ask Joe Lucas. <laughs> oh, she, <laughs> my mum oh, at the premiere. Oh, dear. Well, you did it. You well, can... Thanks. I mean, maybe. Who knows? What? Joking. The mega fans were all into it. We'll see. We'll see how it filters the, through. The harshest bitch in your life by I your know, mother I has know. given it yeah. five stars. Thank you. That's Thank it. you. That's it. <laughs> Die happy. And let's just, I mean, let's who knows not balls it up a, if there's a third season. Who knows if there's a season three? I mean, we don't know that yet. We don't know that. I mean, we definitely don't know. We don't. Who know. can say? No one. No one can it's, say. And we're, we will not be saying anything. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Got the subtlety. This is Insulation. All right, M Salators, that's it from us for another week. Although if you're an extra subscriber, you have part two of Kaz Cook to listen to. On Friday for M Salation Extra, one of you contacted us and wrote the most exquisite letter about a huge life-changing occurrence that Michael and I were the catalyst for. You won't believe, you won't believe it when you hear what's gone on. And we were so honoured that one of you shared this information with us and also we're happy for us to record it and share it with the rest of the Emsolation community. And next week on Extra, Michael and I will be doing a spoiler-laden deep dive behind the scenes, juicy discussion around every episode of the Newsreader because so many of you asked for it. But it'll be an Emsolation Extra exclusive and you don't have to listen to it if you don't want to, but it'll be there for you to go back to once you've seen all six episodes. Our announcement will be happening any day. Keep your eyes on the socials, especially if you're a Sydney Emsolator. And that's it from me. Have a wonderful weekend or week ahead, depending on when you're listening. And I'll see you, hear you around the traps. Bye. Can you feel it getting closer? Feel the growing sense of pride from the outback to the city. And through the countryside Can you hear it? The excitement Hear the music and the cheer For a birthday like no other 200 years In 88 The party's here Tune in to Australia And want more? Emsolation is a totally independent neurodivergent female led podcast, which you can help support by subscribing to Emsolation Extra. Get exclusive bonus episodes every Tuesday. Question time with Em and Michael, pre show meetings, videos of the podcast recording, pre sale access to live events and discount merch, a weekly newsletter, and so much more. Help us by subscribing now or gift a subscription to someone you love at emsolation.supercast.com or get the link via emsolation.com.
and socials. M Salation with M Rossiano is recorded at Down the Hill Studios. Hosted by M Rossiano with Michael Lucas. Executive produced by Benjamin Wosley. Produced by M Rossiano. Edited by Ezekiel Fenn. Socials by M Rossiano, Benjamin Wosley and Marcella Rossiano Barrow. With assistance from Jem Evans and Georgia Watts. With videos by James Henderson. Follow us on Instagram at M Salation Podcast and join other M Salators at the M Salation Group on Facebook. The answer is Harry Styles. Please take the time to share this podcast with a friend. Give us a five star rating and make sure you're following us on whatever podcast app you use by hitting the follow button. Thanks for listening and we can't wait to chat with you again soon.